so I was, uh, you know, fortunate to have a lot of inner island travel as I was learning to fish. And around the time I was 17, 18, started doing trips to Kona to fish tournaments, fish the HIBT and some of the some of the tournaments, which have changed a lot since back then. But um, still, uh, that was a great option. And uh, Kona is just a really unique fishery. For those of you who haven't been there, haven't experienced that, I recommend it. Put it on the list. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's just a different fishery where you do see a lot more big fish and a lot more billfish. And the water uh, allows you to kind of fine tune, especially your trolling spreads and your lures in a way that you don't always get to do when you're fishing rough water and windy conditions. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I guess as, as, uh, over to Oahu, uh, it it actually gets pretty rough. Doesn't, uh, not quite the same as the Kona fishing. That's for sure. No, this year has been a testament to that too. And I think the Hilo boys would say the same, you know, we've had, you know, just uh, a lot of blustery conditions and high winds. And we do get that consistent trade wind uh, on Oahu that we don't have as much leeward coast like like the big island. So we're used to the rough water and we um, kind of adjust our lure fishing to that that conditional uh, day-to-day change. And we love it when we get flat water, but then the fishing is, it never seems as good. So yeah, the, the rough water has its, its pros and cons, but mostly, um, you know, you, you learn to kind of uh, uh, adjust your spread, your lures to finding uh, sweet spots that you, you, just a little different swim patterns and um, performance than you have in the flat water where you really can find tune your bait. Yeah. Yeah. So you're definitely, you know, for a lot of people out there, you know, most people don't get to fish in the type of conditions we do in Kona. So, um, yeah, the majority of people out there are, are not getting to fish in like a swimming pool. So that's a, uh, a really cool thing about your lures is that it's, they're not just set to fish in the flat, calm condition. You, you've experimented in rough water. So guys on the East coast, you know, I've done really well on your lures. I mean, everywhere because they can, you know, you have different shapes that can handle all different things. I mean, I was just down when I was in the Bahamas and well, last year and talking with people and everybody was like, man, my, my favorite all time teaser is the machine. And they were like, they all, they all wanted machines. They all wanted Mira insert machines. And they're like, I'm telling you best, best teaser bait and switch teaser down there. Everybody was saying it. And, uh, so your name uh, and your lures spread all over the oceans. So um, that's, that's always nice to hear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I guess let's let's jump into a bit of what we wanted to kind of talk about. Um, you know, this webinar is is kind of um, where we want to talk about spreads, creating spreads, why different lures work in different positions. That's going to be our main topic. We're going to go into that here, and then creating a sp- spread. Um, depending on what kind of boat you have, you know, whether you have big riggers, whether you're a sport fisher, different things, and then species as well. So huge topic. We're going to try and fit it into this. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm sure Eric and I will dive, like go off the path a little and talk fishing. And, um, and then we kind of want to finish off by, by talking a bunch about, um, just lures in general, um, and, you know, why you want to pick a lure in a certain position um, and all that kind of good stuff. And then we'll finish off talking about some of your more popular lures and um, probably would be great to talk about that slapstick. Um, I swear that it's like a record for how quick those things sell out. Um, it's insane. <laughs> so, so. Uh, Catching lots of fish. That's the main thing. That's the, the goal. That's what we're hearing. Um that's what we're hearing. Yeah. I, uh, I, I mean, I heard about it from Kenton a while back and he was kind of like, Shh. <laughs> you know, he was kind of like, but he was catching them all over. And I'm like, that thing's pretty cool. So, um, yeah, it seems like, it seems like people are in love with that lore. So it'd be cool to talk about that at the end of it. And, um, you know, it's a unique way to rig it as well. So there's some aspects, but 
anyhow, we will start off with uh, lore spreads. So um, I guess let's start off with, you know, um, sport fishers, you know, uh, a properly equipped boat. It's got, got riggers, um, got the option to pull two taglines and teasers and um, the whole setup, you know, pro professional operation. We'll start from that kind of top notch operation. Um, now, uh, what would you suggest in terms of, we'll start off with kind of like more of a Marlin pattern, you know, looking for blue or black Marlin or whatever, um, in terms of trolling lures, um, can you give us a general idea of a spread you would, if you were on the boat as a deck deck in and, and you were setting up the spread, um, what would you pick now? Obviously geographical location is going to make a difference. So, um, I'll kind of leave that in your court. If you want to say, Hey, if I was in the Pacific, I'd do this, if I was in the land or whatever. Um, but that's, it's, that's a big topic to drop on you, buddy. But it, if you could give us a, a rough idea. <laughs> start with saying, uh, you know, we're fishing Marlin spreads. It's, it's different than fishing a meat spread and tournament fishing versus uh, everyday fishing to me. Um, I love small lures. I love uh, straight running baits and easy to eat lures. And uh, that comes from my meat fishing background and my commercial fishing. And that's where pieces like the slapstick and the deep six and magic Malolo, some of those baits that are just, you know, they're every day, you know, you, you hope, hopefully going to get a bite every day on something that's easy to eat and uh, straight. You also have the, the objective of raising fish to the spread that is, um, yeah, it requires a little more to me. I like having some exploding, exploding baits or teasers to help draw that attention to the boat. And while I would, uh, uh, you know, as a general rule, want to have a couple of big baits out there that are really pushing some water and, and uh, creating that commotion that draws fish. I also will have some easy to eat baits out there. Some things that are kind of uh, uh, user friendly and those are your better hookup baits a lot of times. So uh, a spread for me going into a tournament and even an everyday situation would be uh, something like a smash bait or a super plunger or, uh, you know, some of these other, some of the great, like a Coggin plunger, some of these great big baits that as a short bait, you're going to draw that connection uh, to the boat and, uh, really creates a, a draw to the uh, the action of, of the boat being the te the main teaser, you know, the bubbles, bubbling action of the props. That's your main school of fish. And then as you as you drop back, the, your, your baits that you're presenting are kind of connecting um, to that big bait ball. So I would generally choose something like a smash bait for my short bait. My long corner or my second short bait would be something relatively easy to eat. And uh, that's where you get something like a sundowner or a wide range. Uh, everybody loves a purple soft head or a black soft head. Those wide range baits are just hard to beat. They're easy to eat. Fish come back on them if they miss them once or twice. They don't get stung the same way they do on a big hard head. My riggers, I'm still going to go with things that are relatively easy to eat. They might be throwing some water like a, a, a Marlin Magic Ruckus or something that has a, a nice... Uh, aggressive swim pattern, but also uh, in the medium size for the marlin. And then definitely one lure out there in my long baits that's going to be a bullet, either a chrome jet or a deep six, uh, magic bololo, any of the, the, the straight running baits, something really easy for those fallback positions where you raise the fish up short to the boat, then to your big baits. And then as they fall, as they fade back, there's always something back there for them to pick up because uh, even when you're, when you're pitch baiting fish, you see it all the time that they, you raise them to a teaser and then uh, your pitch bait is that fallback bait. And so when they switch off the teaser, they've got something really easy to pop in their mouth. And I think of the same way, you know, it's, it's kind of the same application for lure. Yeah. And so do you find that the bullets, um, straight runner type lures do produce a better hookup ratio. <clears throat> I think 
I think they do. I think they're easier to eat. It's something that's more likely to go down the hatch than a big bait and less likely to get tangled up on the bill. And, you know, that's one of the biggest considerations, I think, in, in uh, some of this lure fishery discussion is, you know, when you're meat fishing, um, your hooks, every, your hook setups or everything's a little bit different, can be a little bit different for, uh, you know, fish that actually bite the heads and bite the lures and bite the skirts, whereas marlin are much more of a uh, suck it down kind of feeder. And they'll smash the bait and then uh, uh, kind of work it into their mouth. So to me, uh, the the whole idea of um, uh, marlin fishing are different. And I love having baits out there that they can just suck down. Yeah. And um, that would be... You know, like your your deep six models, your different bullets, your Uncle Mo's, your Malolo, your Sundowner. Yes. Uh, gosh, is it, there's a, there's a bunch of them that you have. Uh, <laughs> easy, easy to eat. And then I just want to touch on that real quick. You know, I make yeah. a plethora of designs, right? Probably way more designs than are necessary. But I think of this. You know, I, I've also done a lot of the you know river and stream fishing for trout and different fish. And you have your, if you're, you're uh, uh, fishing a, a, a different kind of spawn, some kind of bug, you got all these different um, type of flies you would apply. And it's the same for lure fishing and offshore fishing. And I think just so people understand that, you know, as lure makers, uh, I think we all run into this thing of like, we know that there are certain baits we can run every day to get a bite or that will work if we run over a fish that's hungry or aggressive. They're going to take a shot at it. And yet we still keep coming out with these uh, different variations, but the variations are all very specific and tuned for a different swim action and different application, different water conditions. And so, you know, to me, I, I feel very blessed at this point in what I do in my craft to, to be exploring some of the shapes and designs that I've been pondering for, for my whole life fishing lure and fishing career the last 30 40 years of design i'm finally able to make some of these things that uh were were on the board but now they're coming to life and you really do get some different swim action and some different response from the fish so i i have lures that i could say set it and forget it i know this is going to work it's time tested bite tested um but i also have a lot of new things that are fun that like the slapstick that you know to me kind of fit a fit, fill a different void and fit a different notch and one of my biggest challenges i think as a as a commercial style fisherman and as a meat fisherman is finding things that uh don't cost you thirty dollars every time you get an ono bite or wahoo bite <laughs> they're so expensive these days all the parts all the components so the nice thing about a lure like the slapstick we're trying to get into things that are uh, less expensive for every bite and and you know rig it with flashaboo and you may not have to change that that skirting situation, uh, you know, for a very long time and just keep catching fish on the same lure. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of, a lot of people appreciate that with the, those rubber skirts, um, can get tore up pretty quick. So yeah, setting that up with flash and not having to, to always replace that is, is a good, is a good thing when those toothy fish are around. That's for sure. Um, so I have a question. <clears throat> um, when you're, and, and we'll move on in a little bit to some other spreads, guys. And, and uh, I do see there's a question down here. We'll answer that shortly. And for people who just entered, um, feel free to either post questions down in the question and answer box down here. Or if you want to actually um, talk to us and do like a, an actual ask a question, um, there's a way where there's like a little emoji thing. You can click on that and they'll be able to press a button that shows a little hand that'll come up. And then when we get a second, we'll, we'll, we'll enable your uh, microphone and camera and you can chat with us. But anyways, um, so Eric, in terms of the spreads, right? Um, so in that spread we were talking about on a, on a big sport fisher, um, will you change your lures out throughout the day and change the positions out quite often? Or do you kind of set a spread that you like and you have faith in and kind of stick with it? Um, or are you, um, you like to, see those lures changing um as long as conditions don't completely change you know if you're if conditions staying pretty much similar throughout the day um 
are you, are you switching them around all the time? And, you know, is, is color a thought to you? Like, okay, let's, let's try this color. Uh, let's try this. Or are you kind of more action oriented and just confident on that spread or, you know, like to play around? Um, what's your opinion on that? Well, I think there's different, uh, different things that happen when we're out there. There's, there's definitely, you know, hunting spreads and there's targeting spreads. And so, you know, on a day when you're sitting on bait balls and, and marking fish, uh, you're in targeting mode. And when you're out there and you're not marking fish and there's no sign uh, hunting. And so I do think there's a, you know, to me, definitely a different complex happening there. But overall, you know, in the question about changing baits, I do change baits throughout the course of the day. And what I find is as I kind of fine tune the spread, uh, to the conditions, to the current, um, to, to the fishing conditions, you do end up at a point sometimes in the day where you're like, you know what, everything is on, everything's working. I got every position in, in fire mode and it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of running over that right fish, but I do change baits. And I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I've noticed over the years is it's more common than not that you move something and you get a bite. And so I'm, I'm very interactive when I'm fishing as a deckhand or as a captain, I'm not, never afraid to adjust things, to move things, to change things, because I think uh, in the course of doing that, you know, there's a lot of new, new technology that might give us a better idea of what's going on under the boat. But when we're just using our, our intuition, uh, that movement of something, we, we could have a fish tracking us for a long time. And it's just that one change you make on your rigger and you get a pile on. And, and, and so to me, I'm never afraid to change things, never afraid to move things. And uh, fine tuning the spread, I think, is a constant throughout the course of the day. Even if you're not changing the lure out, you're bringing it in a foot or two. You're finding that sweet spot when you change directions, especially for current. And uh, that can change, you know, uphill, downhill, side swell. But those are all elements that are really important in um, maintaining uh, uh, your, 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 your spread's positions. And I totally believe in touch your gear, play with it, wiggle it, move it. I'm highly prone to have a, a shotgun position that can be adjusted uh, from the bridge if I can, or randomly have the crew uh, do some prospecting with it, which is to uh, bring it in real fast, drop it back, but randomly whether you see a sign or you're in an area, you might think there's a fish, but you get that intuition and sometimes just moving something can create uh, an opportunity. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's a super valuable information for everybody. Um, <clears throat> you know, especially the different spreads, uh, hunting. And then when you're on, on fish, there's, there's definitely a, a difference in that. And I, I think that is such a, a great point that you made at some people may not think, think that way, or they may not have thought, Oh yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, when you're in the zone where, you know, there's one and, or, you know, there's a few, um, you're probably going to have a little bit different spread than when you got to cover some ground and look around and try and create some ruckus and create, create the attention, you know, um, or whether you're actually, uh, tail ending off action that's already created a bait ball or a, something floating or a fad or, um, uh, you know, a ledge that's super active, you know, things like that. So, um, I think that was some, some really good knowledge. I think people can, can take into consideration when they're setting up their spreads. And I do like that you change up your spread all the time. Everybody does everything different, um, you know, does things different. And, um, I think, that that does make a difference. I mean, how many times have we popped something out of the rigor and started reeling it in and boof, you know, it's, uh, it just happens. They sit there and, you know, I was having lunch the other day and talking with somebody who has, um, has had one of those omnis for a while, one of those sonar units. And they were telling me how interesting it is to actually now observe the behavior of these fish, because when we're fishing, we have, without something like that, you don't really know what these fish are doing because sometimes they're in that spread for a long time and we don't see them. Um, but these guys with these sonars will act, you know, they see what these fish are doing and they're actually stalking that spread sometimes for quite a while. And, um, what, what he was telling me was a lot of times he's seeing these fish actually come up in the back of the spread, which in, 
uh, my mind, I always thought they just came up right behind the boat every single time or, you know, or, or came up and woof, ate something out the back, you know, but I always thought, Hey, they come up on the dredge. They come up right off the back of the boat. Um, and this isn't every single fish obviously, but he's saying a good amount of them. He was surprised would do this. They, you know, drive, see the fish, they drive over it. And then it would c come up and come from the back of the spread and sort of work its way in. And a lot of times, um, that's when we get, you know, you'll have these big fish pile on these little bullets and stuff. And, um, so it, it makes sense sometimes to have that easier meal in the back there, because if he's going to pile on that, you might get a better hookup rate. Um, but it's, it's an interesting thing to kind of see the evolution of how we're thinking about fishing um, and how these fish act now that people are kind of able to actually view them underwater with this technology. So um, for whatever that's worth, uh, I, I've been told that quite a few of these fish are at least in Kona waters, everywhere is different, I assume, but um, they come up and kind of stalk the spread and kind of work their way in and come and then come up and eat it. Um, now, that's not always the case because I've definitely had fish like come up and they're in my dredge or something like that. But, but, uh, but it's interesting to, to, to think that, um, that, yeah, that, that, that could be happening. And there could be a fish back there that you don't even know that's back there and you go to change something or put something else out and boom. So that's cool to think about those different, different thoughts. Um, and, uh, I think that that was a pretty good rundown on what you'd run on a sport fisher in terms of, uh, you know, a Marlin spread. Um, we'll jump in to, uh, what would you do different if, uh, for instance, the boss is on the boat and he's like, you no, know, we're talking, you know, big sport fisher. Right. So generally there's a boss that <laughs> and he's like, I want to, I got the kids or what I want to, I want to catch some dinner fish. I want to catch, I want to, I want to catch some fish, you know? Um, now, uh, I'm going to leave that in your court. Um, and I know that you really enjoy catching fish, you know, it's like anything you love catching fish to ah, ahis and mahis and thing, you know, whatever, where I'm kind of a snob with Marlin. So, um, I will <laughs> let you take that and, uh, you have some terrific baits for filling coolers. So, uh, yeah, what, what, um, what would you do? What would you change up on that day? Well, you know, that the, the fun part of that is just that would, my everyday fishing tends to be more meat fish oriented because I love to eat fish. I love to share fish and I love, uh, especially when you're charter fishing or you're taking, uh, the boss's family out, it's giving them the opportunity to catch fish and, it's it most often you know except for people who are like in your mind frame of wanting just the biggest fish in the world which there's plenty of, and there's that's a fun that's a fun uh way to fish right but to me uh it makes everybody's day to put something in the boat or to have something to have some reel go off and so i was never afraid uh when i had to charter boat in kona many years ago i was never afraid to put out the 20s and 30s and 50s for the lighter, um, the lighter tackle action. Cause I always think that is, um, it's always more fun to, to handle tackle that is kind of scaled to the fish. And when obviously we're fishing big giant big blue Marlin, you know, uh, 80 and 130 pound tackle tends to be better for those fish over 500, but there's a lot of fun to be had on 30 pound. You get a different reaction and response from those big fish. So I think that overall small baits, for the meat fishing days or medium sized baits, lighter tackle, lighter leaders, kind of scaling everything down a little bit so that you're getting more action and swim out of the baits. Um, and then uh, always having real baits ready, pitch baits and, and uh, uh, your Charlie set up for my my and just kind of being ready for all those situations that present themselves. And a, a real wise, wise fisherman I used to fish with once told me, in fishing, we all know a little bit, and then it's how we apply it. And uh, to me, you know, having more tricks up your sleeve and a few more things to throw at the fish, especially when you're meat fishing, um, kind of that's the key to having a successful day. And that's not ever being afraid to scale down to little tiny aku lures uh, and smaller baits that sometimes you would think, well, I, I'm not, I'm not in the Aku school, but you put those small little munchkin baits out 
and you get bites. And so I make a lot of kind of munchkin style baits, my baby coolers and my um, uh, little ninjas, which I don't know if you guys, I think, I think we're still working on a big blowout on the, on the little ninjas, but some of those smaller baits really kind of make the day uh, and, and day savers, right. For putting fish in the boat and some poke on the table. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I think that's, some great info for everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, and, and in terms of scaling down to while we were talking about that spread, you'd, you'd probably also scale down your hooks a little bit. Um, would you kind of go down and size a hook for you or you're pretty much going to stay about the same or what? It really depends. So if you're fishing for ahi, ono, mahis, a lot of times those larger hooks are fine. They stick just mm-hmm. fine place but if you know you've got schooly mahis little little you know what we call cane knives that are you know 15 <laughs> under size mahi mahis i love the small claw hooks uh they are very efficient for commercial fishing and and putting fish in the boat and uh, they come in a, in you know all different sizes but the nice thing about this the claw hooks and i can't think of the uh the name of the exact uh make of them but they're they're kind of double strong. So there's a lot of different kind of double hooks you'll see out there, but you want the ones that are really sturdy. And mm-hmm. uh, you can put a lot of, you can put a lot of heat on those and they don't bend out and you don't have to worry. You can still, you still get the good swim action out of the baits. So when it comes to, to scaling down hooks, I do tend to go to the claws, the claw hooks, or, um, you know, smaller hooks but i hate to go below 10 out because i do feel like a lot of our offshore fish if you get too small then you do get a good shot at a big bigger fish and when you go to put heat on them on leader even a little bit you take a chance of breaking or bending a hook yeah and i I guess that's always the thing to be aware of as well if you're you might be out there just meat fishing but if you're in a place that big big blue marlin or black marlin live uh they don't discriminate against little lures. They'll eat a little lure. So that's something to always keep in mind too. Um, that happens. <clears throat> that happens a couple times a year in Kona where someone will put, you know, 200 or 300 pound leader on a little tiny lure out the back to catch an ahi and they hook one over 800 and that doesn't end well. Um, so that's a thought to, <clears throat> to keep in the back of your mind is that um, while you're fishing for these meat fish, there's probably something chasing those things around too, if you got big fish around. So, um, yeah, you, you never know. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that's cool. I know, um, Jason uses those, those claw hooks you're talking about and he loves that flea, flea uh, lure. They, they do pretty good on that. Yeah. Good bait. That, that, I mean, yeah. Just around great tuna bait, small fish bait, and it's caught big ahis. It's caught ones. <clears throat> uh that the the small baits like i said i just i love making small lures because they do they they're a part of uh the part of your fishing day that and a part of your your tools that are so important and uh it's really important to always have a set of small baits that's ready to, ready to launch uh, when you need them because you just don't always know until you find a floater or something and you get chewed up real fast. It's always good to have backups of those smaller baits and you like, just like you would have a backup set for your Wahoo baits. Um, but always to have, uh, you know, a good assortment of things like the flea and baby coolers, small ninjas, um, some of those things that, yeah, it's to me and the small bullets, I, I make a, a small version of the deep six and the deep six is probably of all the lures I make. Uh, one of my all time favorites. And one of the things that i probably don't ever want to fish without and i do the very most people are familiar with the mirrored style it's something like that Mm -hmm. one but i make it in silver and some different colors and i do some light ones now with the dichroic that are really really oh yeah excelling because i think in places where you flat water it's nice to have a little less weight in it you definitely have an easier time tuning the bait getting it up on the surface that lure swizzle and in my opinion all bullets are supposed to be up on the surface kind of swizzling and black water ruffling that's the action that gets crushed um, but i make a, a six inch version of that deep six that has just been one of my um, favorite um, offshore prospecting baits and and just kind of uh, 
you know, if you want to catch an ahi, you want to catch a big aku, big skipjack, which we love to eat here in Hawaii. So those are the lures that I love. Those are my go-to. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's hard to beat a deep six. That's for sure. That that dichron, that white one that you sent me, that thing is insane, man. Um, and so people who, if if you're not aware, there's you have three sizes for the deep six, right? Or I do Cur- currently the the nine inch and the six inch are available. I'll be I'll be making more seven inch really soon. We had a, a problem with one of the masters, and so um, okay, my masters. You know, I've ha- I have the same masters that I've had for decades. So when you talk about something like a deep six, that's from the original set of three masters I made in uh, the late nineties, and I use those to make all the molds. And so there's a lot, there's a lot of consistency now that we didn't have going back to when I was a kid and everything was kind of, you know, a little bit smaller, or a little bit bigger, able to produce things that are absolutely identical in form and weight and uh, performance. And so that's, that's a really fun part. So the seven inch will be coming back because I know there's a lot of people waiting and to all of my, you know, Easy customers and, and longtime customers and test riders out there, my team riders. Uh, thank you for your patience because, you know, this is a, a, a process. Making lures is very labor intensive and there's a lot of steps involved. And um, what, what, when I'm making batches of one thing, sometimes I'm not making batches of other things. And so I appreciate everybody reminding me when there are uh, things they need and want. And, uh, we have some batches of things coming soon that have been, uh, I know, on the on the list of uh, people's needs for a while, including the smoking loons, which are another favorite out uh, short rigger bait. It's uh, the medium. The medium is just incredible on the large has also done a lot of damage to big fish. So be patient and thank you for your patience because they're coming. <laughs> awesome. Um, very cool. So. Uh... Or, um, well, I guess we kind of hit the, the sport fishing side of the bigger boat type <clears throat> thing, but you know, there's a lot of guys out there that, um, they don't have the luxury of fishing, a you know, fully equipped sport fisher with all the rigor setups and everything. And, um, I would assume a lot of the, you know, a lot of the guys in Oahu, there's a lot of skiff fishermen over there that do really well on your lures, same in Kona. Yeah. Um, but, uh, they have to change their spread up a little bit because they don't have the same ability, uh, as, as a big sport fisher would. Um, so, you know, in terms of setting up a spread now, if you're on a skiff and you're going out, um, for Marlin or for a meat fish, what kind of changes would you make, uh, or would you recommend people make in a skiff, um, as opposed to, you know, a bigger sport fisher, um, with all the, amenities you know this is a great point and this is something that you know i comes up a lot because most of my friends here locally they're if they're not fishing a sport fishing boat or one of the charter boats they are on small boats and smaller boats and you tend to throw more white water with your props especially with your your io or you know your in out outboard motors they just throw more white water and more turbulence which kind of hides the baits so you know there's a a real affinity for angle face baits that push water and create bubble trails and have a lot of surface commotion. But one of the underrated styles is the cup face baits that really get down and swim deeper. So my friends who are fishing with more turbulent um, prop washes, I always recommend their short baits. I make a lure called the beauty. I've been making it for decades. I make, all different sizes of beauty, but the cup face really anchors the lure well. It gives it a really strong, the barrel shape of the beauty, it gives it a really strong wiggle, almost like a natural bait swimming. And they get down deep. And um, so for your short positions on a skiff, those deeper swimming baits, those baits that have the cup face, and I mean cup like, like spooned out, I'm trying, I don't have one right here to show you, but those are the ones that I recommend and this also applies to big boats and rough water so if you're fishing a uh you know a big sport fish or or you're targeting marlin 
the XL beauty and the double XL beauty. These are big cup face baits that in short positions, they get down into that, into that turbulent white water and, and below that turbulent white water. So you get more presentation. And so rough water and uh, any situation on a smaller boat where you have more turbulent position close to the boat, you think, and this is kind of my own, my own, uh, one of my things I think about a lot, the boat, you really do get a lot of strikes close to, to, to the boat on almost every boat as long as you things are fine tuned and you're not making some weird squeaks and noises that are scaring the fish. And I know, I, I, you know, you've talked about electrolysis and some of those effects and how they can um, really change the bite. I have had problems with props that scared fish away. And so I'm, I'm very aware of, of what can happen if things aren't sounding right under the boat. But I do believe that those short positions are your, are your money a lot of times. And so even if you're not getting the bite on those short positions, they just tend to be the, uh, the draw that brings you the bites to the riggers. And that might be a little different when you're tuna fishing, when you're looking at those longer positions as more, as more consistent. But uh, I've caught a lot of ahi on my short baits and a lot of ahi in the short positions. And so I also just kind of believe that there's um, overall uh, creating that, that great short spread is super important. Then for your long spreads on a skiff, it's kind of the same, you know, bullets. I love chrome, chrome jets and I love straight running lures. And uh, one lure I didn't really even brush on is the Super Ninja, but that's been one of my go-to baits for long positions. And that was originally designed with the idea that a bullet should be a part of every spread. And uh, in trying to get people... Uh, in other fisheries where they were just trying to fish more explosive fret spreads or more marlinish spreads uh, to fish a bullet, I found the Super Ninja kind of crossed that crossed that boundary. It made it a little easier for somebody to say, "Wow, that looks really fishy," and they would actually put it out and and put something in the spread that's really easy to eat, has a really unique swim action to it. It's not your standard bullet, but those are the kinds of um, skiff baits that I I think consistently do well. Bullets. Super Ninja, Magic Malolos, Deep Six, and then on your shorts, going to things that get down below that white water if you're throwing a real turbulent uh, prop wash. Yeah, I mean, that is <clears throat> very, very informative right there, Eric. Thank you. That was, I think a lot of people will find a lot of value in that. Um, <clears throat> very interesting what you're saying about lures that will get down below that prop wash. Um, as well as lures that are going to work in the rough too, because, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of surface action going on, on outboard boats. And then also if you're fishing somewhere that's super rough and, um, you know, has a lot of, a lot of white on the surface. And if you can get that bait farther down, um, it actually creates a great silhouette if they're looking up at it and it's down below, but when it's up in that wash, I feel like you kind of get yourself in some trouble or they may still see it, but maybe your bites just won't be quite as good. Um, and so getting, getting it down and, and in that cleaner water is, is key. And if you don't have the ability to get it outside of it with big riggers, then you know, what you're saying is those cup type lures and things like that are, are going to, are going to work better and the bullets and things like that. Um, awesome. Um, Flashaboo, rubber skirts, love them both. Or do you have a, do you have a, a, an opinion on that? Love them both. I think there's applications for both. Uh, you know, rubber sticks to the water real well. And it, it, it I, I don't know, but you know, to me, it's what I grew up fishing. So I guess I feel really confident and comfortable with rubber skirts guys who fish a lot of rough water will often add a third skirt, you know, two or three skirts. So you get a little more volume. And um, while that is uh, uh, up to the individual, it, it has been brought to my attention too many times that uh, that third skirt well, ru with rubber, that, that volume hides the hooks better and you tend to get more bites. So when you're talking flashaboo, it's kind of the opposite. Flashaboo has very little volume. It's thin, it's wiggly, it's reflective. And once again, you know, you can't, you can't 
discount that it is one of the top producing new styles of lures fishing flashaboo. And I think that there's a lot to be said for that. I've had a lot of top captains tell me, you know, I'm not sure if it's the head or the flashaboo, but for whatever reason, they don't leave that one alone. And so I think uh, it's important to have a, a mixed spread, you know, and really uh, to me, I always believe in kind of having an offering for the fish. You were talking about colors earlier. I think it's the same. And that's why you sometimes, if you're hunting, uh, changing out colors can never hurt because, well, some fish may not be color sensitive. I have fished with some really great fishermen who would change their teaser colors and talking squid chains and, and uh, flopper chains, and they would change those colors and it would really make a difference in the action. We got to the spread when we found the right color that was tuned in, it, uh, it made a difference. So I think uh, anytime we, we think we understand what fish see and how they see it, we're probably wrong. And, uh, well, movement and action, swim action, and just uh, things wiggling around out there uh, will draw attention and a bite from most fish on days when maybe they're specifically feeding on a certain a certain thing. Those colors really do matter. And uh, yeah, overall, yeah, switch it up. Definitely have a flashaboo bait out there. Definitely have a couple baits with rubber. Some lures run better with rubber. Uh, than flash and obviously you can't run flash on everything because you get the you have the tangling issues so the bullets and the straight runners and things that that take flash yeah they definitely i know the deep six and the super ninja with flash are just deadly yep yep and that's a, that's a good point to make about flash view tangling on certain lures too is um for people who aren't aware <clears throat> you don't often see flash on a very uh steep a, you know, cut face lure. It's usually always just on bullets or, you know, jets um, because it will tangle. Um, if it's a lure that's got a lot of different movement in it, for whatever reason, we do end up with tangles in it. So then you're in a situation with a lot of those lures where you got to go rubber or vinyl. Um, and like Eric's saying, yeah, some lures just run better with rubber skirts and some with vinyl and some with flash. And the only way you can tell is by experimenting and see what works for you, what works on your boat. Um, you get the bullets will have different action depending on what, <clears throat> what you have on there, whether you have a rubber skirt, whether you have a triple skirts, um, or whether you have flash and some guys, you know, um, want that action and, and it's just switching up that action that does, does definitely help. So that's, uh, that's certainly interesting. You know, um, I have certain lures that when I have three skirts on it, they just dish rag really well on the surface and they just get hammered. And if I switch it over to flash, they don't really dish rag and they kind of more black water and, and swim and stay down and still get bit. But some of them just certain days, they want that and certain days. So um, it's, it's, it's good to uh, experiment and kind of have all the options. So uh, that was, that was really helpful. Um, well, I think we kind of hit pretty good on a lot of the topics uh, between the two different types of boats and, and spreads and, um, and, uh, you know, we can kind of continue on some more of just basic lore type stuff, but why don't we get answer a couple of the questions we got here real quickly and see, um, what we got going here. So we have somebody here, Vernon's asking, um, what would you change going from calm to rough water? Um, would you change the lures? Would you run them farther back or pull them down in the rigor? Um, well, Eric, what are your, uh, what are your thoughts on that? A combination of all three. Yeah. Uh, test, test my riggers and see if that, if that kind of uh, solved the situation. Cause especially if you've got a, a set of baits that's working real well and you like the way they're swimming, pulling them down in the riggers a little bit, running them off the rod tip that can make all the difference. Um, but I'm also, Hey, when the water conditions change, that's why I make uh, a line of, of lures for all conditions. So you know, switching up your baits um, can make all the difference, especially when you're in a big transition. You know, sometimes it's just a little, a little uh, uh, surface bump. But if you're really, you know, wind picks up and conditions totally change, um, especially going to the rough, I'm going to uh, cut face baits. I'm going to flat face baits, which are highly underrated. All the flat face baits that, that um, 
kind of track straight and true. They have a little more drag coefficient, but they also tend to be really easy to eat. And so, um, yeah, I'd, I'd say a combination of all those things. And the other thing we didn't touch on when, with, in the skirt conversation was vinyl, because uh, another really important, especially with bigger baits, vinyl skirting is uh, rough water, flat water, a lighter material lets your lure perform a little uh, more freely with a little more release. And so um, just something else to consider going flat to rough. You might want to go to rubber. You're, you're fishing flat. The vinyl's working great. You get in the rough. You need something that's going to stick to the water a little more. That's when you switch to your rubber skirted baits. Um, but vinyl will work in the rough water just as well also. So it's kind of just really, you know, like I was talking about earlier, tuning your spread. I think all those transitions in the course of a day give you another opportunity to look at what you're doing, move things around, adjust positions, adjust baits and head styles to, to fit uh, the changes. Yep. Yeah. I think that's some great, great information right there. Um, the other thing I'm um, curious your opinion on is, uh, you know, if you're in the rough or the conditions change, another thing that I've done is change the position on the wave sometimes. Uh, is that something, you know, like for instance, with the tubes, I, I, I might try and bring it down a little bit, uh, down on the face a bit more um, or change it around would you personally mess around with that or do you like to just if it's not working where it's optimally supposed to be working you just switch it out um or do you or do you will you change the face of the wave that the lure is running um on you know if you have a spread that's working and and you you feel like a uh, little position changes are going to get it into a sweeter spot tucking it down into the, the bottom of the wave or even yeah. into the the beginning of the back of the wave sometimes you can get a you can get a good spin there especially for those uh lures with a lot of where it really wants to break away um but you're loving that that bubble trail that tubular bubble trail you can you can you know i fished tubes in rough water with great success in oahu and they weren't lures that most guys would choose to run because you just they're just fine tuning and so that's another thing you know it, to me, the, the, the laziest or the, the thing you can do to kind of shoot yourself the worst is being a little bit lazy in, in correcting your spread. I have lures, um, the original smash baits, and guys who know the original smash baits that were completely unweighted. All, uh, the, a lot of the stuff I'm making now is belly weighted, um, and people prefer that, especially for the, the newer hook setups with the single, the single rigs and some of the great new uh, skirt and um, hook options that we have and knowledge we have from underwater footage and, and how fish eat, getting better hookup ratios on our billfish. But um, overall, just that uh, uh, reality that uh, these lures can be adjusted to a point and then you may wanna switch up and put something different in the, in the position. And that's, that's the call you have to make, but not adjusting things is really a failure point because I know my old smash baits, I might have to tune them 30 times in a day to keep the sweet spot. They were unweighted, but when you had it in that sweet spot, if you ran over a fish, you had a really good chance, chance of getting a, a, a reaction out of it. Yeah. So, you know, that's something that is just part of lure trolling is, getting them adjusting them throughout the day you're going to change you know even just on your tack uh you know a lot of places people are fishing the, the conditions change when you're going down sea when you're going <clears throat> when you're quartering sea whatever things are going to change in that spread so your crew should be constantly adjusting things um that's what does help with using uh tag lines and using um the little hangers a little dacron hangers and things like that you can adjust them pretty easily in and out throughout the day bring them up and down and um that that helps for sure and you know if you got a lure that's just jumping out of the water all the time um get to that thing before the captain notices it if you're working on the deck because that it drives most captains that pull it drives them crazy if that thing's jumping out of the water and you're not doing anything about it like 
try and stay on that. And there's a time where you just, that lure can't be run anymore. If you can't, you positioned it, change, change the angle, change the position in the wave, whatever it is, um, then it's time to switch it up and, and put something else out there. And it's amazing, uh, amazing how much a difference uh, six inches can make. Six inches or a foot adjustments in and out. Um, sometimes it's a very subtle, a subtle adjustment you're making that, that keeps the bait in the sweet spot. Yeah. And, and when we're talking about positioning a bait on, on the wave, uh, you know, for, for people who aren't really so familiar with that is your, your waves in your wake. And, you know, it's, it's similar to maybe surfing or something where depending where it's at on the, on the wave, it's going to create a different action. So obviously, you know, if you're down at the bottom of the wave, you're going to have less, less speed. You're going to have a little bit less action down there. You know, if you're right at the top, you're really going to be plowing. It's going to be pushing. You're getting your speed. If you're off the back, you're also going to be not going quite as quick. So depending where you adjust it on the face of that wave uh, is going to affect the action of the lure. And you'll notice as you troll lures throughout time that certain lures like certain positions on waves. And, um, you know, a general idea is like having them close to the top, you know, with an aggressive lure it's going to be a really aggressive lure <laughs> and that's what you pretty much want it doing. So that, that's stuff to play around with. Um, and if you're new to lure fishing, that's what makes it so fun is, is getting out there and messing around with them. And it, and it makes a difference. It really does. Um, and you know, will will you catch a, a Marlin or a, 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 another fish on something that's not positioned correctly? Sure. But overall you're going to get better bites and, and fool bigger fish when you have them correct, correctly positioned. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that helped there. Um, let's see, we got one more question, a couple more questions here. Um, flashaboo skirts. Um, I, I I would say that's pretty much you're going to probably run that in a bullet in the stinger. But in terms of a position, would you? Does that make any difference to you, flashaboo and and uh, position? Or it's just no, not not necessarily. I mean, I, you you could. I think the, like the Niyama fish head, some of his stuff is, you know, the, done so well with the in shorter positions. Yeah. I think, you know, flash can go anywhere in the spread. Um, the main thing is just paying attention. And I think this goes for big baits too. Just another thing we haven't really touched on, but you know, part of, part of uh, uh, your tuning your spread and, and adjusting your spread is checking your spread. And we're so fortunate in Hawaii. We don't really have the challenges that I, I know a lot of my friends in the mainland and the Gulf and, uh, and Bermuda and some of the places where they get all the grassy water or they're constantly yeah. struggling to just keep their, their presentation clear, right? And here we don't have that, but we also, um, there's always the chance that a hook will cr crisscross or that depending on how your hook rigs are set up, if you're running doubles or you'll get uh, a little tangle with a, a skirt or, or a penetration of a, one of your legs of your skirt onto a hook tip. Some of those things can change the swim action of your bait. And if you're paying attention, you'll notice it. Uh, vinyl, as much as we love it, it will bunch up sometimes. So, you know, bring your baits in and check them. I'm never afraid to move a bait. If I think something's just a little bit cockeye or maybe the hook, maybe the hook, you know, I always, I like to have my hooks pinned uh, so that they rudder the bait. And that's a whole nother aspect of, of tuning your spread and in flat water, it's, it's much more predictable and something that, that we, you know, exercise every day as, as just kind of how we, we set our spread is how we fine tune our hook placement in the bait. Rough water, things roll a little bit more. You may have a little more variation. Um, but the reality is if something doesn't look right, crank it in real fast. It can't hurt ever to bring something in moving something in the spread can always bring you a bite or, or raise a reaction out of a fish that was being lazy. And so um, bring it in, check it, put it back out and get it back out there as fast as you can. But just moving that to bring it in is never a bad thing. And it's always more uh, to me, more better to be proactive and know that all your stuff looks great than to sit there and kind of wonder for a while, because I can tell you, I have had times where the bait didn't look right on that long rigger but we were getting bites on everything and saw some swirls on it, but you just left it out there. And then maybe an hour or two later, you, you're like, you know what? I got to check that thing. You bring it in and the, the hook got chopped off by an Ono. They, they just clipped you right in the back or the skirts got hit. 
and you think your bait wasn't running good. So you're missing a presentation position and you only have, you know, three, four or five positions to present. You want to make sure they all look good. Yeah, that's a really good point, you know, because <clears throat> you could also spook a fish too. They might come up on, on, they want that lure, but it's all of a sudden it's doing something weird and either spook it or you get a bad bite from that fish too. Because if that lure's rolling or too erratic or doing something weird, you're going to get a bad bite and a bad hookup rate. And um, that can happen. Um, so yeah, it's, <clears throat> it's important to kind of know what you want your lures to look like and what they should be doing. And the only way to do that is just get out there and pull lures and you do it long enough and you can look at something and, and instantly think, Oh, there's something wrong with the angle of the coil coming out of that head, or there's gotta be something wrong with where the hook is at, or, you know, there's, there's so many little variations to lures, um, that it just, they make a big difference in how that thing's going to swim. And it's, it's not as simple as just throw it out there, go eight knots and, you know, you're going to get bit. I mean, maybe if you put out a bunch of purple soft heads, but, um, once you start, you know, having, uh, you know, professionally made, you know, handcrafted lures, you gotta, you gotta tune them. You gotta move them around. It's the art of lure fishing. It's what makes it so fun. Uh, cool. so, um, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, knowing the positions, knowing where to put them, how they're going to run, stay, you know, keeping an eye on them. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's, those are all really good points. Uh, now, uh, we got, let's see, Kenton's chimed in here. Um, <laughs> he wants to know about not using barbs on your trolling hooks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> only did it once. It only took one. Well, okay, so there's a story to this, I guess. So what's the story here? <laughs> Kenton would bring this up. So, you know, and and we've seen hook technology come a long way. And, you know, for us in the in the in the past, you know, we would sharpen our hooks with a file to get them to the right place. And then there was kind of the evolution to the grinder and taking things down to kind of more more, you know, um, um needly shapes or or penetrative shapes but one thing that i have noticed uh is that so often with billfish and especially once you catch a big fish and get to play with their mouth something over 800 you'll find that it's it's a hard place to put a hook into and so a lot of the hooks a lot of the fish that we were catching for a while in kona where i would get these fish up we were letting them go but the hook had barely penetrated all the way to the barb so you're getting about two thirds of the, of the uh, tip of the hook and you're catching the fish, but you're not getting full penetration. So we, we did an experiment one day and I had uh, grinded all the hooks down, removed the barbs, needle pointed them. They were beautiful. They were, they were works of art. I'm like, this is it. We're going to pin them. And we got off Kaivi and hit the 800 fathom mark and a giant fish piled on our long rigger. And uh, we had her on and everything looked good, but uh, the barbless hook did not work out. And you know, the unfortunate thing about some of these experiments is once you have a fish like that come unbuttoned, uh, it, 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 you not only second guess yourself, you, I think, uh, just throw the hooks away. <laughs> So that was the end of that experiment. You didn't mess around anymore after it. I went away from barbless after that. It was a one yeah. shot. But Kenton remembers it because that fish was beautiful and she was big and, and we really should have caught her, but it probably, you know, the other thing that Marlin fishing, there's so, there's so many variables involved. And this is one thing just for people to keep in mind. There is no perfect way to set up everything for a Marlin that they're going to eat it perfectly and get hooked every time. I mean, there, there's a lot more consistency now created um, with our, I think some of the single hook rigs and some of these hooks that are coming out now, this, the, the stay stuck line is amazing. I, I love um, the whole, not only theory, but the practice and the way it's worked out for the pull point on the hook and the penetration it allows. 
but you know also the hook designs have changed and we've really come a long way in understanding uh, just what it takes to penetrate some of those harder materials in the mouth and the bill and so you know uh, but the, there's a lot of variables so you're going to miss a lot more before you're going to catch them but uh, you'll as you fine-tune your 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 lures and your hook rigs you'll find things that have more consistency and seem to work out better and uh, if you're paying attention to your stuff maybe you'll have less hootered fish because that's you know a big part of marlin fishing also and that bill gets in the way of half the bites so um yeah you know all of these all of these elements come together when we're talking about lure fishing and picking a spread and then one thing i i, I like to recommend i'm always i always feel so grateful to be able to put together a spread of lures for for a customer uh with the skirts and the way that i think it would present beautifully but I also always recommend people, these are the, these are the, the things that are going to help you uh, be a better fisherman, is learning how to skirt the heads, learning how to do your hook rigs, um, playing with the lure, putting some love into it, and handling them. Uh, you're going you're gonna to really get kind of more intimate with how, like you were saying, the coil, the coil of the loop of the leader comes out of the head, and uh, whether you know that should be that coil direction should be down or up or you know how that lure really works and uh all these elements kind of come together to uh, uh create a great bait and then to create a great spread and so the more involved you get in kind of picking your lures and skirting them and rigging them i think the more uh, the more understanding you get of what it takes to be a better fisherman yeah <laughs> and uh it, it's um reminded me to bring up a point when you're talking about skirting <clears throat> how you like to skirt up lures for people and, and have it um i know you like to use wings a lot um most most of the lures i get from you that are pre-skirted have pretty cool wings on there and uh they get bit so <laughs> what are your what are your thoughts on the wings and you know a lot of people only put wings on bullets or something but uh the the best smash bait i ever had 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 wings on the sides of it so Yes. What's your uh, what's your what's your thought on that? I am a huge proponent of wings. There is nothing in the ocean that doesn't have a fin or a tail or some appendage that sticks out and flutters and is a little different color or a little different shape. And so, to me, adding adding wings creates breakup. It adds a little uh, more lifelike quality. Um, and so, we could have a whole discussion on wings, and I think we should because. Uh, I have a lot of different styles of wings that I use, and um, I've been uh, playing with some new wing configurations that I really also am excited to share. Uh, but I do think wings are just a really a key part of So let's say you go out and you're going to buy the lures uh, skirted. You can add your own wing variations and your own wing configurations to, to personalize the bait to your spread. And these are things that are fun to do, and they really do, I think, add... Uh, uh, to me, I can't imagine fishing too many lures without a wing, and that's because I get more bites. I think they just get more bites. Sorry, I had myself mic uh, muted. Um, yeah, I I I think they make a difference for sure. And I'll I'll say one thing. I I saw a couple years back we um, we had a, a smash bait with with some silver wings along the side. It was, uh, one very lucky smash bait that Kenton had. And, uh, it ended up on the bottom of the ocean out there on one of those sea mounts he fishes, unfortunately, but before then it won us quite a lot of money. Um, and it just got bit, but, uh, it just had, um, you know, your, your regular, very like the super reflective, uh, uh, fish scales type wings on it. And so we, we had one fish that we killed in, um, I think it might have been the firecracker tournament. I cannot remember which one it was, but uh, we were on it for a little while and we were chasing it around and it was just doing one of those things where it was on the surface swimming around and we were chasing it. And I could see that lure, the wings like flashing deep down in the water from a ways away when I'm up in the bridge and I could, you know, we're, we use really long leaders. And so that when that lure had slid up to the top of the leader, um, I could see that, that flash, uh, from far away and i could see exactly where that fish was it was pretty cool but it it 
traveled through the water that 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 glow and that flash and everything so well it just kind of that sold me on the on the wings just adding that little extra little extra you know color or a little extra flash or a little extra you know and, and we don't know what that fish sees when it comes up on that bait um you know you look at videos and there's plenty of times where that fish is stalking the lure for a while and he kind of comes up and then stops kind of comes up and then all of a sudden out of nowhere boom piles on and for all we know it could just be a little flash of something you know a color change or something or a little something that triggers that bite and so screwing around and messing around with different options and um the wings are are really cool you know um i'm kind of at a point where i'm putting wings on almost everything i run out there so and you, you you're the 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 reason for that because uh i i started getting you know lures from you and they always had wings on them and um you know i i remember chip was working with me and he was saw all my lures with my wings and he's like oh this is like a a wahoo style and i said yeah wait watch what happens and boom so i like wings you got me sold on them um and i'm i'm excited to see uh what variations you got going and um it's it's cool all the different materials i i learned the different materials from you when i get certain lures you know that there's different materials you're using as the wings and um yeah it's it's really cool so wings are we approve <laughs> I've got some new material to share with you too. I just, uh, I've been kind of stocking up on some new stuff. I'm excited to share. And yeah. Well, we should, we should talk about wings at some point. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole discussion for sure. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm glad we brought that up. Um, cause I think it makes a difference on all lures. I do like it. Um, cool, cool. Um, well, I guess let's chat a bit more, um, got a little bit time left here. And then before we kind of go into any more questions and answers and stuff like that. Um, and, and Kenton's saying he's got to head off. I, 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 uh, uh, sent him a request to get on the live stream, but he's got a, he's got a role. He said, um, <clears throat> but, uh, anyways, I guess what would be a cool thing to chat about is some of your popular baits and giving us a little, you know, maybe a little history on them or, uh, some tips or, um, you know, stuff that people would want to hear. Um, and considering it is one of the most high demand and, and everybody seems to be loving it right now, the slapstick, um, what's the story with that thing? What's, what's, uh, let us, let us know. And, and also it's an, it's an interesting way that to rig it. And I've had several people ask us, you know, how should we really rig this thing correctly? And, uh, and so, yeah, give us, give us a little rundown on the, on the old slapstick. Okay. So I, over the years I have had, uh, uh, my thinking about lure fishing has fallen into a couple of different categories and growing up, um, one of my favorite captains, Mike Christie always told me that it was, uh, his theory was flash and glow and flash and glow, um, to me falls into two categories. So one is the things that are the most reflective, the brightest, they have the most light attraction. And I kind of built my entire line of fishing lures around mirrors, dichroic glass, things that have that kind of eminent glow and flash, no matter where you see them in the spread or what position they're in in the water. Big believer in that. And then the other, the other uh, whole family is realism. And so things that actually represent and look just like a bait fish, they look just like a, 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 something that would be natural, whether it's being trolled or it's on the sink, because so often you hook a fish and you slow down a little. And so if you still have baits out, especially meat fishing, you're not bringing everything in. Usually you have lures that are still in the water and there still should be fishing. And so, um, that's where things like Magic Malolo and my ninjas, they still have that uh, lifelike quality that I think will get them a bite even on a slower troll. And so they have that functionality. The last few years, last four or five years, I started getting into uh, actual lifelike molding of fish. 
And uh, we've seen we've seen this, uh, you know, a lot of lure makers are, are exploring this uh, craft. And we have some really great, beautiful, incredible work being done by like John Niyama and his fish heads. Um, uh, Kona Lures has got some great pieces. Um, and then, you know, for me, it was a natural offshoot from the Ninja to have something. And I think I've been working on it for about 30 years, trying to get things that were actually lifelike uh, bait fish. So uh, I, exploring all this molding, I had a couple of great successes. And one of the first ones was a small Malolo that I molded. So for people who are, are looking at these lures and they're, they're um, excited about maybe even trying the molding process themselves, I can tell you there is a huge failure rate. <laughs> and so when we see these beautiful products that come out that are actually molded fish, uh, there's probably been 10 or 12 attempts to get to that one good mold or to get to that one good piece. And so I've had some, uh, some successes, but many, many failures. And that small Malolo was one of my, my first successes. And it became now the slapstick because that shape was perfect. And for those, you know, if you examine it really closely, it, it has some elements that I really like that actually I won't go into detail on because I think people need to just try it and see how it works. But I started making them about four years ago. Kenton's the first one to get them. I knew in his commercial fishing, he would have uh, opportunities to really test, test them and see what they did. You know, it's a whole new theory to have, you know, a real long bait because longer baits sometimes can, can, can be less effective. Um, you're creating more bite surface that doesn't have a hook in it. But for me, the perfection of the slapstick is that it's small. It's easy to swallow and it looks like a living thing. And in the testing that Kenton did, he proved time and time again, this thing just gets bit. And so even though uh, uh, he goes to places where the fishing, you know, the seamounts uh, off of our islands here, they're hundred miles away. The fishing is incredible. The fisheries are strong. You can drag anything and probably get a bite. But what was impressive is that he was getting the, the, the time to drag these, uh, the slapsticks and some of the other testing products that I give him to, to run and see what they do in, out in the deep water, in the blue water, where you don't get as many bites. And people would think, you know, you're out there in the ocean, you're 100 miles from shore, uh, there's fish everywhere. But the ocean is a vast desert. Uh, and then you find places that are specifically alive and you, you have, especially where you have sea mountains or you have traveling schools of fish, but there's a lot of desert out there. So when you have a lure that's successful out in the deep blue, when you're out just kind of traveling, um, uh, that's, a, that's a win and that's a, a good mark or uh, uh, we'll give that a star. And then um, some of the applications that he was able to use the, the slapstick for were really kind of cool to me too, because we, we were, really we didn't have a direction for it in the beginning. I had to put actually a, a wing on it and it was a bird and uh, the wing didn't last very long, but it still kept getting bites on the troll. But then he took it and he was using it as a, um, a toss in bait for uh, his chum lines. And so he'd have uh the, the basically the school of fish pollute up under the boat then they they throw a little bit of chum into the water or palu and get the fish to come up to the surface and he could toss because of the weight of the, the slapstick it was a perfect bait to slap into that chum line and he was catching fish on it really well uh using it just kind of kind of as a a um, what we call the a slap bait and so um it, it, it's been tested both as a trolling lure and as a pitch bait. And uh, it's just excelled in all of those categories. So I'm excited to see how people do with it. You know, there's, there's no such thing as a perfect lure, but to me, uh, any lure that gets a lot of bites is going to catch a lot of fish eventually. And um, I think that this is one of those lures that's in that meat fish category that um, just gets me excited. And so uh, I'm excited that other people are excited and I appreciate everyone's patience once again, because 
the production of these things is, uh, is, is challenging, but we are, uh, we're working to improve that. I have another batch going out to GZ Lures on Monday, so you guys can look for those coming up soon. And um, uh, yeah, just excited for the response uh, and uh, some of the nice messages I'm getting from guys who are using them and catching a lot of fish. Uh, that always is my highest reward because I can't be out there fishing every day. As a lure maker, my greatest blessing is that I may not be out there, but somewhere in the world, someone's dragging some aloha. And that to me is, uh, it's really special. So it makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, seems like they're they're crushing them on that bait. So um, it'll it'll be exciting to see how that evolves through fishing and, and um you know, what, what big catches come from it. Um, the slapstick now, the rigging on that is unique. Um, what do you recommend? Um, and what have you seen and, you know, hookup wise too, or is it, uh, is it a high hookup bait or, or is it kind of an aggressive explosion? And, um, you know, like should guys be, um, pulling a bigger hook or a smaller hook? I mean, what, do, what are your thoughts on, um, just uh how to rig it you know what what do you what do you recommend people do with this the way the bait is set up uh and the way that kenton's been fishing it with great success is with a small single skirt and so that's why the first release we've done we've done uh rubber skirts on them um but i've seen a lot of guys who are fishing flashaboo on them i think uh me personally i would go to the flash the flashaboo i think that that's a, a great strong presentation and you know, the, the way the length of uh, the regular flash of we get, if you kind of fold it in the middle, it's the perfect size to conceal a hook. But also on this lure, the hook is not meant to be concealed as much. It's really the tail of the bait. And so that's kind of the beauty of the, the slapstick is that however you're rigging it, it should be simple. The head is representational. So that's what's going to keep the fish's interest. Whatever hook you have in there is the tail. In fact, the first versions I made didn't even have a skirt. That was something that uh, Kenton added a skirt to it, but the originals didn't have a skirt at all. It was just a hook and uh, they worked as well. So I'm thinking single hook. I think the presentation that Kenton's done really well with is a single 11, um, but you could go down to a 10 if you felt more confident. My thing really is about a free swinging hook. I don't think you want to pin the hook on this. There might be fishermen out there that have greater success and, and uh, figure some things out that, that work for them that might be better. But to me, uh, just loop, single loop, free swinging. The hook is the tail. You get a lot of wiggle out of it that way. It also, because it's a long bait, will give it the freedom to stay in the water. The more you kind of make that one solid unit, you may have more jumping or, or kind of a stiff swimming. And, um, the idea would be for me in creation of the slapstick is something that has kind of a freedom to, uh, uh, swim and wiggle and flop with that loose hook connection, free swinging hook, and also ideally lighter leader. And, you know, for, for me, uh, 150 to 300 would be the leader of my choice. Uh, things that, that aren't going to constrain the bait because it does look so natural. You're going to get those bites out of it just because of, of its natural appearance. And the other thing is slower speeds work too. It doesn't have to be, you know, full speed. If you're, if you're fishing a floater, you're fishing around structure like a buoy, uh, you can come in a little slower and you see it still has a really nice wiggle and swim. It was actually, in my original thinking, going to be a slower trolling bait. Yeah, so for guys that pull a mixed spread of, of <clears throat> natural baits and and lures, uh, this is a great addition. You know, there's there's some guys out there that are trolling at you know seven knots or something or six eight or whatever something like that. Um, this could be a great one to add to it. And I I think I even saw you mention which I never even thought of, but guys on on yachts on sailboats. Yeah. Uh, this could be a really good bait for that. Uh, as you're cruising between islands or whatever. So, uh, yeah, that's, it's exciting. Um, you know, it has a lot of attention and, and, um, it's just going to be cool to see. I like, I like seeing different things entered into, 
entered into the fishing world. So it'll, it'll be fun to watch where that rolls. Um, so yeah, is there anything else you want to add about that or, uh, um, I am working on a lighter version too. Uh, oh. you know, the original version is, is kind of a, a core lead and it was, uh, you know, another one of my thinking early thinking on it was as a jig. So it was, um, it had kind of multiple applications, but Kenton had a couple of the light versions that did really, really well. And so I'll be making some of those and they'll be available soon. Um, but uh, for, for fishing flat water, Kona water, or once again, fishing around structure where you're trolling a little slower, I think the light version is really going to work out well. Sailboat fishing, things where you don't, you don't necessarily need that lead. You just need something that's kind of skittering back there and looks, looks real. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's exciting. Um, all right. Well, I guess, you know, we talked about the slapstick, which is, a you know, somewhat new, well, newer bait, you know, than a lot of people, but I think, um, you know, we're kind of getting short on time here, but I think it would be silly not to at least touch on, uh, the smash bait <laughs> and <laughs> give us, give us, uh, I mean, you don't have to go into the whole, you know, the, the, the entire story of the smash, but, um, yeah, I mean, give us a little, uh, information on the smash bait and what you, where you like, you know, what you would say for people to run it and, and rubber vinyl, whatever, just any information on it. You know, um, for me that, that lore has contributed to a lot of my fishing success, whether we've caught fish on it or, or raised fish on it. It's, it's been a, a key, a key bait in my spread. Um, and, and that, that's another thing guys that, you know, we hadn't really touched on too much is that there's lures in your spread that may not get bit, but are still contributing to your bites. Um, and that, that's a hard one to know, but that's, what's cr creating a good balance spread. will you know, you, you'll, you'll notice that, you know, certain lures complement each other and Hey, when I have this out, you know, this lore is getting bit and, you know, um, but for me, smash bait's been a, been a really good, good lore, especially if I'm covering some water, if I'm looking around, um, cause that thing pushes, pushes, makes some noise. And, uh, the other thing I've noticed with that lore is my hookup rate's pretty good, uh, especially for an aggressive lure because it's, it's a, it's a fairly straight running lure for the most part. And, uh, yeah, I've had good, good success on the smash. And I think most people have in the world, uh, and, and on the small one, the baby smash, and then now the infant smash and, uh, really cool. So what are, yeah, give us, give us a little, uh, little smash eight rundown and what you think people might want to hear. You know, the, like so many of the, the things I've created over the years, I mean, they're works in progress and there's an evolution. And so the smash bait, in the beginning, when I was making lures, uh, I was lathe cutting every piece, every uh, casting I did. Um, I had a couple of molds I really liked. And, um, you know, another thing that, that just to, to kind of uh, highlight lure swim patterns, the angle on the face of a lure and the centeredness of the uh, center point or the, the, the tubing is really key to consistency. And every angle has a slightly different swim. You change it by a degree or two, you get a little different swim. Um, the smash bait started out as a plug, a, 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 what I considered a big plug at the time. I cut it out of an orange juice can. Uh, I, don't, I, they don't, I don't even know. I guess they do still have these, uh, you know, your concentrated uh, uh, juice containers. Well, that's what I used to make a lot of my um, masters from. And so uh, I had uh, made a larger plug that I was going to use to cut down on the lathe. I, I had an angle that I really liked that had been successful and the swim pattern was successful. And I made a mold of this thing and it was really just a, uh, a plug that I would cut different shapes from because I love working on the lathe and spinning things. And uh, I found that, you know, some of the, the sexier shapes that we create that have uh, maybe some, some drawback in the tail, those things really affect the swim and they, they allow the lure, especially for rough water to lock in a little bit more. And um, so it was a plug. The, smash, the original smash bait was a plug that ended up getting trolled in its 
plug state and kind of kept out fishing everything else. So uh, I look at looking back over time, you know, I've, I made the, the other, that original plug almost 40 years ago. And it probably smash bait has kind of come into itself in the last 25 years as, as something that's, you know, just been consistently productive. Um, but there's been changes along the way. The master has changed a little bit here and there. My original molds for smash bait used to crush and that's where it got its name. Cause you put all the, after you, you use a, uh, the rubber molds for enough times and you're putting rubber bands on it, they would get a little bit more squeezed every time to the point where the lure had a little bit of an oblong pinch to it. And uh, that's where the smash bait name evolution came from. And so the current smash bait is more, is more perfect. And I feel like we've, I've kind of worked some of the, the more finite bugs out of that piece where I, I call it perfect. It's done. I'm not going to change it anymore, but I have had it. I have added some uh, different sizes. And uh, the other one I'm really excited to share with people is the the new um, super smash. Uh, we I've been playing with the belly weight, getting it kind of finer tuned towards the, the bottom most position in the belly of the lure you know in in so many ways when we're fishing flat water uh, we don't always need that belly weight but with the new hook rigs and the new hook systems we're fishing the belly weight really helps to balance especially if you're running your hook down tip down which is kind of the consensus for more consistent hookups and better hookup ratios for for billfish um, so that it's all an evolution but the smash bait, you know, I'm really proud of it. it. It's it's caught me so many fish, and I mean, I caught a I caught a thousand pound fish on it, and missed several others that I you know kind of wish it stayed on. But uh, with those big fish, uh, there are a lot of variables, like what we were talking about earlier. And you know, it, it, for most people who are really seriously targeting big fish, you're gonna see a few and miss a few before you actually get a hook in one that sticks. And if you're gonna stick a big fish, there's a pretty good chance you could do it on a smash bait. There's a lot of good, there's a lot of options out there for big lures. But to me, I can't imagine uh, fishing a tournament or fishing specifically a billfish spread without a smash bait in the water. Yeah, yeah, same. That's cool. Um, <clears throat> just to bring it up real quick, since you, you mentioned the hook rigs people are using now. Um, Basically, we're, you know, in the past, people used to use big, heavy double hooks and fixed double hooks. And that allows you to create a lot more stability on that lure. So once people stop using that double hook rig, like the, the standard that most of everybody's using now is a single hook rig, pretty far back in the skirt, meaning far back, meaning you know, down towards the end of the skirt um, and the, the hook point facing down. Um and so it changes the way the stability is on the lure. So I think that has made a lot of lure makers have to put a little more belly weight in it um, or, you know, put belly weight in it. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's changed the way some lures will run. And uh, I think it's what Eric's talking about with the way that people are now running hook rigs uh, is that it, it, it's different than in the past where you had these big bulky uh double hook rigs and you really could do a lot with a lure with those you could steer it and you can do a lot with a single hook rig too but uh those big double hook rigs kind of had a life of their own i guess <laughs> um well, it's a lot more fish with the double hook rigs you just tend to hooter a lot of fish and, and that's kind of the drawback that i see um that that's really changed the way people target billfish and the consistency the change in consistency for the hookup ratios yeah, for sure. I think that majority of people are in agreement that the, that the single hook rig will outfish a double hook rig. Uh, you know, not on every bite, but on a majority of bites that we would get is, uh, you know, my, my experience with a double hook rig is you get a lot of, and then she's, she's gone and it, cause it was on its pill or whatever. And, um, so yeah, that single hook rigs, um, and I'm excited to see these, the, 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 the variations of the smash that you have coming out. Um, I've done good with the smash and vinyl and rubber skirts made no difference to me. They, they work phenomenal in both. Uh, and, 
Yeah, great, great lore. <laughs> Hard to beat it. Um, well, we're kind of running out of time here, guys. Uh, I got, I'll, we'll answer a question here about the weighted lures. Um, belly weighted lures, will you run a lure if it's not bal ballasted, with, if it's not weighted? Uh, yeah, I definitely will. What, what do you think? <laughs> well, absolutely. Half of the things I make are centrifugally weighted baits. And, you know, I, this is something to me, uh, it shouldn't even be, it goes without saying that lures that have a centrifugally balanced bait, which means a center weight that is either circular or it's not offset or belly weighted, they actually run a lot better. They have a lot more freedom. They swim freely. They make their movements more naturally. Uh, belly weighted lures, when you're running in the right conditions and they're, they're locked in flat water, they'll stay very consistent. But if you're in rough water or the seas change, when they do make a transition and have to roll, they look horrible. That's what we call a spin or a flop. You know, they kind of, they look, clunk over. And so um, uh, centrifugally balanced baits or zero weighted baits will never do that. They always look perfect. And so I think that uh, there's definitely, there should be positions in your spread that are belly weighted and there should be positions that are not. And so for bullets, they don't need to be belly weighted. And sometimes that belly weight is so soft or gentle or, or subtle that it doesn't really affect the swim bait, uh, swim of the bait uh, anyway, uh, especially with bullets. You may or may not have an actual effect or, or uh, a difference from, um, uh, from something that's... So yeah, I, I definitely think that there's, there's different lures that have different swims and you want to incorporate both types of lures and the majority of, of the application I see for, for belly weight and especially specifically belly weighted is sharp angled pieces that have, you know, a lot of, of, um, of surface action and commotion uh, that, that can really kind of help stabilize the bait, especially if you're running a single hook and you're using that rudder in a down position, which, you know, the hook naturally wants to roll up. If you just drag a, a hook by itself, that tip kind of wants to roll up always and so when you put it in that unnatural down position you need that that counterbalance to hold it in in place and give it a little more stability and so i know we need to wrap it up here pretty quick i don't know if there are any more questions but um i just wanted to thank you guys at gz lures and thank all your customers and um thank you for having me here today to talk about this i had a nice talk with cole this morning and we're going to do a couple of um uh, giveaways and uh, one of them is going to be uh, one of these. This is a new piece. This is called a Maui Splunge. And it has not been released yet, but we are going to do one of these as a giveaway for people who are, are watching the, uh, the, the cast today. And I think uh, Cole said, you know, if you do an Aloha Lures purchase today or tomorrow, um, you'll be entered to win one of these. And also, I think that there's a, uh, um, a couple of slapsticks also that uh, will be available for customers of Aloha Lures today and tomorrow. And uh, thank you guys for coming. And, and uh, I, love, I love being able to share all this stuff. And it turns out that when you're on camera, it doesn't make you look 10 pounds heavier. It just makes you look 10 pounds older. <laughs> I hate looking at myself in these, <laughs> in these computer cameras. Yeah, it's tough. But uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Eric. Really do appreciate it, man. And Thank you for all you're doing for the industry and, and for all of us, you know, all, uh, our fishing success is, uh, you know, all, all your lures and, and all your aloha. It's just, uh, it's awesome, man. I really appreciate everything. Um, and uh, we're going to have to do this again because there's just so much to talk about. There's this, we could, I mean, there's so many topics and things we can talk about. So I'd, I'd love to do it again with you. Um, before we head out guys, is there anything anyone would, want to say or, or jump on real quick and say what's up uh let us know if if not we'll uh we'll let eric get going um but thank you everybody for for jumping on our first gz live event uh we will continue to do these um we have a good little l list of people and we'll continue to fill that schedule up and if there's anything you want to see or if you want a particular person on there message us let us know um, this is all about, you know, providing some cool knowledge and, uh, 
getting getting you in the same room with 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 people in the industry and um, answering questions and and having fun with it. So um, let us know. Um, this entire episode was streamed on YouTube and it's also been recorded. So this will be available whenever um, it's not available just to the GZ Elite um, members. This one will be available to everybody. Uh, we're thinking a lot of the ones we do with lore makers are going to be just a public one. Um, there's going to be there's going to be some that are uh, available just to our uh, the elite members. Um, so if you haven't checked out our elite subscription service, check it out. Um, it's uh, we're, we're trying to add a lot of really cool elements to it. And, uh, and it, 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 we're hoping that it becomes a platform that can really help people just bring their game up and fishing and, and provide some cool stuff. Um, beyond that guys, I think, uh, I think we'll probably roll. Um, Eric, anything else you want to leave with or, uh, uh a big, go. big thank you to uh, everyone who could, uh, could watch us today and, and take part and ask questions and uh, thank you to all my customers and and uh, team riders and people who appreciate the aloha lures and a big thank you to all the other lure makers out there who are, are doing their thing and creating uh, exceptional tools for our everyday fishing and uh, a lot of my call my friends and so uh, I feel uh, very honored to be uh, doing my my trade and getting to create my art and uh, appreciate all the support from you guys at GZ and my other uh, tackle uh, retailers that, that keep me going and keep me motivated. So, uh, yeah, thank you all. Awesome. Well, thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. And thank you guys for being on here. So we'll wrap it up, and we will see you next time. Our next uh, webinar is with uh, Willie off the Rochambeau. And we're going to talk about tuna fishing and fishing off the East coast and natural bait fishing and a little bit different, different thing than, the, than just the lure pulling. So keep an eye on that. We'll post that. And um, all right, guys, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric. Okay.